world, there's no such thing as death. That's this field doesn't go away. Even if the inside collapses and you disappear, you don't die. And guess what happens when you find out you don't die? You're no longer afraid. Guess what happens when you're no longer afraid? You can't be controlled. That's why we can't eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. Because we will probably rebel. This is one of my favorite toys. This is dryer duct, you know, stuff that takes your hot air from your dryer. This was made. This is a torus. This is a 4D object. See how it unfolds on itself? Through the North Pole, goes out through the South Pole. Okay, you sit in the center of this. Your spine is this hole. Okay, that's your spine. And your head sits here and your legs come out here. And this thing surrounds you like a, what do they call those ballet skirts? Whoops. Let me get that. What do they call those ballets? Tutus. Like a tutu. Thank you. And, um, and I'm about to prove to you that the Mayans knew all about this, too. So let's go to the next one. Here it is. This is the higher dimensional Taurus, a sketch of it. This is how it works. This is infinite, never dies, never goes away, just keeps recycling itself. When you die, this doesn't disappear. It lifts up off the earth. What it does when you die is it folds in on itself, okay? And you start going up that little hole through the center. That's the tunnel that people see when they die. That's the center. They're unfolding and going up this center. The Hindus have a thing. It's called the Shashumna. And they say that everyone has one. It's called the Shashumna. And what it is, it's a, a, a vorticular stream that comes down from above and attaches right here to the top of your head, right above your pineal gland. And it's a 400 millionth the width of a human hair, the Shashumna. And it attaches your ethereal body, this body, this light body, this higher dimensional body. It attaches it to the Earth's higher dimensional body. Remember the one we saw around the Earth? That's attached to you. And the Earth's attached to the sun's higher dimensional body, and the sun's is attached to the galaxies, and the galaxies is probably attached to God. Okay? This is what they don't want you to know, because that means you're part of God. You're part of the creative essence. Okay? And these archons don't want you to know this. That's why I, 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 I really kind of, uh, um, you know, I, 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 the, um, the Gnostics, you know about the Gnostics? 2,000 years ago, the second biggest religion on earth was Gnosticism. Okay? The biggest was Hinduism. And the Gnostics believed that there was a false god. And this false god was trying to convince us that we were nothing. Okay? And the Gnostics just bristled at this and fought against it, argued against it. Hypatia, who was the curator of the library at Alexandra, was one of the greatest ar arguers against this idea that we were nothing. And she was raped and killed for her because she was such a successful arguer of this. But we are this higher dimensional body. And uh, they don't want you to know it. Uh-oh. Okay. This is Jose Arguez's higher dimensional body. And he has the cube. See the cube behind it? I'll explain that to you. Scientists don't like circles. They like squares, okay? They, everything has to be quantified for scientists. So scientists decided to try to describe this higher dimensional force that seems to sit around nature. And they came up with the hypercube. Now, a Rubik's cube is a hypercube, okay? At the center of this cube pattern is a cube, just like one of these little cubes. It sits right in the center. It pivots. Everything pivots around that center cube, right? Okay? So there's one cube in the center. There's 27 cubes total here. There's one cube in the center, and there's 26 cubes that surround that center cube. Got it? Okay. The center cube 
is matter, three-dimensional matter, the earth, the solar system, your body, an atom. Okay? The force that goes around it is the electrons or the higher, the electromagnetic field, the, um, you know, all, all of these ethereal things we can use to describe it. And, 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 and when they did this, we realized that if you subtracted the center, you'd have 26 aspects of this higher dimensional force. 26 is, in the Kabbalah, is the number of God. A harmonic of 26 is 260, which is the sacred Mayan number, which they said they counted their year off in 260 days, which is exactly human gestation, by the way. That's how long you spend in the womb, 260 days, okay? And so then we looked and we were thinking, well, that's strange. You know, there's 26 in the Kabbalah. 260 is the number of days in gestation. This is what the Mayans are measuring. But then we realized, holy Kamoli, 26,000 is the length of the whole year. So these are called harmonics. They're all harmonics of each other, and they're working in tangent together to try to tell you that the timing frequency, that the people who don't want you to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, they don't want you to know this. That's why all the Mayan codexes were destroyed as soon as they got there. They burned everything. If it hadn't been for the, somebody, some priest copying over the popal view, boo, we wouldn't even have that. The very first thing that they always do is destroy the culture that they arrive at, and, and, and over and over. And that's because it's the archons who don't want you to know this. Because if you, we, they killed everybody in Europe in the Inquisition, all the psychic people, which is, by the way, the big problem with all the white people, is they killed all of our psychics, and so we've had, we have to go to indigenous cultures to find anything out about the psychic world because our psychics got murdered. Now, there's been enough time now. Our psychics are beginning to come back and, and everything. But, you know, it was a devastating loss. And I think it caused the harm that the Inquisition did to world history. I, I, it can't even be, uh, it can't be overestimated. And, of course, women have a... Uh, a more psychic nature than men, although I think men have a more firm grasp of it uh, in the real world, like Nostradamus. Um, so anyway, Jose is trying to show, Jose Arguez is trying to show the link between the light body and this square, this hypercube, which is again just a squared off version of the torus with the center cube and the 26 surrounding matrix cubes, okay? Well, as I got into this, I began realizing that we have all, in the, in the West especially, after studying alchemy, Chinese alchemy, Taoist alchemy, Hindu alchemy, the indigenous alchemy, uh, every single culture on earth has an alchemical tradition. It doesn't matter where you are. Every culture has it. And this alchemical tradition is always based on this hypercube, hyperspace. But other cultures seem to be saying that something that our culture refuses to acknowledge, which is that time has a quantifying uh, particle. In other words, time is not just something that happens during a duration. Time is something that can be quantified. It's like a river. You can actually scope it out. So you're, you, sometimes you're going down a river uh, in a mountain and it's rapid, you know, the rapids are going over rocks, you're going very fast, and sometimes it's a placid mountain lake, and sometimes it's a big wide river like the Mississippi, but it's all time, but there's different parts of it, just like noon is different than midnight, okay? So time has a pattern, and when you understand that time has a pattern and how you can use that pattern in your life, you become free of time. And time travels, like everything else, in a hyper shape. You know, and, uh, Pons and Fleshman are these two scientists, and they did this work called cold fusion. And they were actually able to generate electricity, more electricity than they put into the system. And this came out, and everyone was, oh, this is the key to, you know, instant electricity and free energy. And then they did the experiment a couple months later, and it didn't work. 
And uh, I had a friend, and he did the experiment up on Pikes Peak in Colorado, and it worked. And then he took it to the bottom of Pikes Peak, and it didn't work. And they did the experiment in New York, and it worked, but then they tried it in Boston, and it didn't. Then they tried it in, you know, New Guinea, and it worked, but it didn't work in Australia. And, and everybody's like, what in the world? You know, what's going on here? <clears throat> and the reason that it didn't work, and it does work, is because of the flow of time. Because they were positioned, they didn't know it, but they were positioning their experiment, just happened to be at the right moment in time when this singularity, this miracle occurred. Okay, alchemists, you know, are always chastised. This crazy man, he's in his basement for 20 years. He does the same experiment over and over and over and over and over and with no results. And that's obviously this person must be insane. Anyone who would do the same thing over and over expecting a different result, that is the explanation of, of, of insanity. Yet, strangely enough, occasionally, one of these experiments would work. And someone would come with this strange white powder. And they stick it in some wine or in some water and they drink it. And pretty soon, you know, 30 years later, they didn't look like they aged today. And you, you may say, oh, this can't be true. But you know, if you go through the reports in, in Europe, there are people, there were people walking around for hundreds of years. There's Count St. Germain, the most famous, but also Rabbi Falk. Uh, who was arrested for uh, distributing the elixir of life in London, got kicked out of London in the 1700s. He was seen in 1820, and he looked 30 years younger than he did last time he was seen. Fulcanelli, the guy that wrote the book that I, he, was, he, did, he, he left this planet supposedly in 1930, yet he was seen in 1955, and he had lost 25 years, exactly the time period that he hadn't been seen. So he was regressing backwards towards youth. By the way, the Harry Potter, the first Harry Potter book, I never read it, but I saw the movie. It is the story of Falconelli. I find it interesting that a very, very, very not so well known fable about the last known alchemist was turned into a best selling book by J.K. Rowling uh, that sold more books than any book ever. And nobody knows that it's actually a Falconelli legend that Falconelli's prized student, Eugene Cancellet, received a aristocratically written letter telling him to go to a train station in Spain. He went to the train station. He was taken up into a castle in the Pyrenees Mountains in southern France where everyone dressed medieval clothing and they were teaching gifted students alchemy. This was a legend that he told the world about in 1953. I'm sure J.K. must have known about this legend. She wrote the book based on, on this legend. That's not the point. The point is this. Here's this little known legend that she writes about and it hits like a nerve.